Good morning. How is everyone doing? Good conference so far? Brilliant. Um, I've got a few things I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about the present. And I want to talk to you about the future. And then I've also got quite a big announcement to make to you this morning. Because I learned at conferences, that's what you do. You make big announcements, yeah? Um, you know, big product announcements. But as an independent Wi-Fi guy, I've never really had a big product to announce. So I thought, hey, why not do it this year? So big announcement. But first, the future of protocol analysis. Or particularly, the future of wireless protocol analysis. I don't know what you think when you think about the future of protocol analysis. Maybe you think of something like this. Sitting in a data center wearing a VR headset and then just magically plucking packets out the air. Maybe that's what you think about. I don't know. Um, or maybe you sit and go, well, the thing is, Peter, does anyone actually look at packets anymore? Come on, Wireshark, looking through traces and traces and hundreds of packets. Do we really need to do that nowadays? Um, is protocol analysis just dead? I wanted to give you a nice picture this morning to look at. Is it, is it, do we actually really need to do it anymore? Because let's face it, guys, we have these two very special letters, don't we? AI. Is AI not the solution to fixing all our problems when it comes to protocol analysis? Um, can it not just do all the analysis for us and then we don't need to do it anymore? In fact, you know, I'm the Wi-Fi analysis guy. Is my time up? Next year, is it just going to be a bot on stage giving my presentation because I'm not needed anymore? Um, it's an interesting question, I think. Um, I, I was going to talk on this slide for much longer than um, I am going to because I've got some stuff I actually want to show you um, and I'll run out of time if I do. But So if you're interested in talking more about what I think about it and why I think it, come and chat to me afterwards. But the short answer is I don't think protocol analysis is dead. Um, I think that while AI and machine learning is really good, and I think it can probably get even, maybe not there now, but potentially we can get to 80, 90% of all problems fixed with AI. There's always going to be that 10%. There's always going to be the 10% of problems it's not going to be able to detect. Um, AI algorithms are really good at detecting things we already know about that break networks, finding patterns that we program them to find. They're not so good at finding the things that we don't know about, that proprietary protocol that we don't know anything about. Or if, let's say, there was a problem with the OFDMA scheduling algorithm. I don't even, does anyone actually really know how OFDM scheduling algorithms work today? Let alone be able to write a program to be able to define a problem with it. So there's always going to be a need for detailed analysis of protocol, in my opinion. The problem is, how do we do it? Okay, and this is where I want to talk about the present. Because we very much traditionally, I think, in, when we think about wireless protocol analysis, we think about something like this. A laptop with some sort of wireless adapter, wireless NIC, which is going to capture some packets off the air. Um, I've been using wireless NICs to do protocol analysis capture for the last 20 years. And it's been really successful for me. But it has some problems, I believe, today. Um, and, and a number of real problems today. Um, first of all, if you look at the modern technologies, you look at um, 802.11ax, 6 gigahertz, it's really hard to find adapters which can snip and capture packets off the air. It's really hard just to find USB adapters um, full stop. Um, you can use the Intel AX200 um, and 210 chipsets, um, but they're integrated adapters. So I can put one in my machine, but that's about it. Or maybe I could use a WLN Pi Pro, and I've got two adapters in that. 
But one of the problems with just having one adapter or two adapters is when you're troubleshooting, you want to be on the channel that the client that has a problem is on. And clients roam, don't they? And how many times have you been trying to troubleshoot a problem and you've done a packet capture and then the client has a problem and you go, oh, I wasn't on the right channel because I've roamed and not. And actually capturing that data is quite difficult. Um, so this has been, this isn't a new problem, it's been a problem for a while, um, and we've had various solutions to these problems over the time. Um, some of them as shown on these pictures here. Um, on the left hand side, you have my good friend Jerry, um, they're capturing with multiple NIC CADs. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems when we're capturing with multiple NIC CADs though, is that you've got to somehow power them all. And you can plug them all into your laptop and power them via the USB. There's just not enough power. So we need a powered hub. When you've got a powered hub, you're connected to a power supply. So how can you follow a client around it when it's roaming? It's going to roam away from you and you're not going to capture the packets because now you're tied to a power supply. Now, I have used a shopping trolley with a PoE battery in connected to a PoE hub and 20 adapters and pushed it around following someone who was doing some work in a supermarket. You can do that, um, but then there's another problem. If you've got that many devices in one hub, especially with modern data race, you're going to drop packets on the USB hub, because it, it, it's not fast enough. So you're not going to capture all the packets. So that moves me to my tried and tested I don't know what I'm going to call it, but this is on the, the other side of the screen is my tried and tested Wi-Fi analysis trolley. I have been using this as my packet analysis capture device for at least probably eight to nine years now. And I have fixed many problems with it. It is three laptops. All laptops run OmniPeak. Each laptop has um, two USB hubs plugged into it, one in either side. The laptops were picked specifically because they've got separate USB buses. Um, in each hub, I can get about, if it's a really, really busy network, I can get about four devices, okay, before I drop packets, if, the, if all four channels are fully utilized or, or heavily utilized. So that's eight devices per laptop. And then I do a separate capture on each laptop from all the devices, and I get about 24, 25, depending on how many adapters I want to connect, plugged in. And all my adapters are there on the top of the trolley. And I have pushed that around many sites, many offices. I've pushed it around distribution centers, following clients around until they have problems. And it works, okay? It's, a, it's an okay solution. It's a little bit Columbus, isn't it? It's like not the smallest thing to carry around with me. It doesn't neatly fit in my backpack, but it's how I've been doing protocol analysis for the last number of years. But is it future-proof as a solution? It's not. And it's not future-proof because we've just got the six gigahertz band opened up. And if I've got 59 new channels to capture on, how many laptops and dongles do I need? I'm going to be driving around a truck, let alone pushing around a trolley. Um, it's not really a scalable solution. It's been okay for 2, 4, and 5 gig. I don't want to do 2, 4, 5 gig and 6 gigahertz with this solution. So what I've been trying to think about, well, could I come up with some other solutions. I've considered using maybe some sort of single board computer. Um, the original WLN Pi was nice and small, and I thought if I can plug a USB hub into that with maybe three adapters and then have lots of them, could I build my own box, big packet capture box, have them all with a switch in there and have it all coming back and streaming into an adapter. I love, um, I've got one here, the M4 WLAN Pi. If you've not played with it, loved its tool, use it all the time. It's a great packet capture tool, and I can plug in um, three Comfets adapters into this so with the built-in CAD. It gives me four six gigahertz capture channels, and it works really well, and I've been able to successfully capture on four channels, six gigahertz, and not really drop any packets. But again, 
it would be an awful lot of these to try and come up with a solution which would capture me all the channels. And I'm not too sure how the aggregation would work of the Ethernet, even whether I would exceed, I could very easily exceed a one gig Ethernet port going to my laptop. Or, so then do I have to look at 10 gig and it starts to get expensive. So, so brilliant if you want to do some lab testing, capture on four or, or so channels. I'm not sure for capturing on all channels it's going to cut it. That's not my only problems. I've got more problems with traditional packet capture. One of those is security. Now, JJ won't let me say security is a problem, but from a protocol and um, troubleshooting perspective, when all my data is encrypted, what can I see? So with WPA version three on being mandatory on six gigahertz, what does that mean? Well, it gives me a few problems. First of all, when we just said WPA2, if it was pre-shared key and I knew the key, I could decode all the traffic. And I've used that so many times in troubleshooting. How many times do you go to a site and they tell you that the Wi-Fi is slow? I get this all the time. I do a lot of retail, so I go to a warehouse. All the barcode scanners want a pre-shared key network. There's voice pickers and they go, oh, we're getting slow responses. And I do the analysis and the Wi-Fi looks okay. Then I decrypt the traffic and look at the application layer and go, it's your application server causing you your slow responses. It's actually something on the back end. But if I can't see the traffic decrypted, I can't do that analysis anymore. Um, so that's a problem. Um, but it gets worse than that in 6 gigahertz because management frame protection is mandatory. So now action frames, which are really useful when troubleshooting, Maybe we've, there's been a channel switch announcement frame and the BSS has moved channel and that's when all the problems occurred. You're not going to see that. It's going to be encrypted. Someone's been de-authenticated. That frame will be encrypted too. So a lot of the things that we use for troubleshooting we're not going to see. So that gives us a problem. It gets worse though. There's more problems. They're not finished yet. Okay, multi-user technologies. First, really, we started seeing these problems with 802.11ac. Um, 802.11ac um, standardized transmit beamforming um, in a way where it could be implemented, and we had multi-user MIMO built on top of transmit beamforming. What, what does it do? Well, transmit beamforming is all about beaming a signal so the, the, what I send on each antenna is in phase when it hits the receiver. It's about creating a beam transmission to one particular location. Well, if I'm capturing over here, I'm not in that location. I can't capture that traffic. In fact, the only person in that location is the user who's receiving the traffic. And therefore, when we look at multi-user MIMO, it's doing that to multiple devices. There's no way I can be in all three places at the same time. We cannot capture multi-user MIMO data frames. Doesn't bother me too much because multi-user MIMO, we can set up in the lab, but we don't really see it in the wild that much. However, 802.11ax, which is the only way we send data in 6 gigahertz, also has a multi-user protocol. It's OFDMA. So what can we capture with OFDMA? Well, I've spent quite a lot of time trying to answer that question. And that's what I want to chat to you about um, this morning. So first of all, let's just make sure we're all familiar with what OFDMA is. And I don't want to spend too long on the technology, but basically, just so everyone is clear, one of the, the way OFDMA does multi-user is it takes a channel and it splits it up into, you can almost think of smaller channels, but we call them resource units, sections of the channel. And it allows, the APs allow to use these smaller sections to transmit to multiple clients at the same time. So it can transmit on a channel, but different bits of the channel, we call them resource units, are assigned to different users. And that's what we would call downstream OFDMA. The APs send in down to the clients, but then we also have upstream OFDMA where clients use small chunks of the 
ch channel to transmit upstream to the client so they can transmit at the same time. It's a multi-user technology. Now, to understand how that works and what we can capture, we need to go into a little bit more detail. The detail I've put on these slides, I'm not describing in full detail. They're just really to give a talking point. Um, if you're interested in what all these fields and things do, come and sit one of my CWAP classes, okay? Um, but what I want to introduce to you is the different physical layer, what we call PPDUs, physical layer protocol data units that 802.11ax introduces. I'm not gonna talk too much about the one at the bottom because I've never seen it actually implemented yet in the wild. But the top three are ones we see used quite a lot. So let me explain what they are. The top one is what we call a HE, a high efficiency, that's just what the AX physical layer is called, a high efficiency single user PPDU. AX doesn't have to use OFDMA, it can just use OFDM and use the entire channel to, uh, uh, a DAP can send the entire channel to one user, one user can send back. It's what we're used to seeing with A, B, G, N, okay, well not B, but um, other technologies. Um, so if it's going to use the entire channel in a traditional wireless way, we use a HE single user PPDU. That's just what the frame format is. The next frame format on this slide is what we call HE multi-user PPDU. This is how the, the frame the AP uses when it transmits to clients downstream. So this is when we're doing downlink OFDMA, okay? The AP is gonna send a multi-user PPDU and that will be split up across the channel into lots of different data for different users. So that's the frame format we use when the AP is doing downlink OFDMA. Make sense? The next frame format is what we call the HE trigger-based PPDU. And this is how the clients or the, the transmit upstream OFDMA to the AP. They are gonna be just transmitting th this frame on a section of the channel, on a resource unit. So they're gonna be transmitting just on that one resource unit, a frame, and they use what we call the HE trigger-based PPDU. Why is it called a trigger-based PPDU? Well, because these uplink transmissions are triggered by the AP. And it's why we also have something called a trigger frame. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go into all the fields of a trigger frame, um, it's mainly here for reference, but trigger frames are what the AP does to trigger OFDMA transmissions. It needs to, if it's gonna down, um, send data in a downlink direction, it needs to tell which clients, hey, I'm gonna, you're, I'm gonna send data to you and I'm gonna send it in this chunk of the channel. I'm gonna send data to you in this chunk of the channel. I'm gonna send data to you in this chunk of the channel. So when it, it does that in a trigger frame, but then we also, it also triggers uplink. So it'll go, okay, you three guys, or four guys, or whoever it is, you transmit now. And it does that sending a trigger frame. So we get different types of trigger frames, um, and that's how this all works. Okay, now we know a little bit of background Let's actually try and look at what can we capture. So my first attempts at capturing um, OFDMA was using an AX200 chipset. Um, and I did a packet capture. And it was, it, could I capture OFDMA? That was what I was interested in. Well, take a look at this column here in Wireshark, which we're looking at the format. Every single AX packet that I seemed to be able to capture was all HE single user. Just like, and I was like, great, it's multi-user MIMO again. We can't capture the multi-user traffic. We can capture all the single user traffic, but there was no multi-user traffic at all. I could see trigger frames. You'll see in black on this slide, there's trigger frames, but I couldn't see the data it was triggering.
Then came the discovery of using a Jetson Nano with an Intel AX200 NIC inside it. Um, and what you could do was there was something called a HE sniffer params file, which allowed us to put in an association ID in Mac. Now, why was that important? Well, the reason we couldn't capture multi-user MIMO traffic was think about it. A client station, a NIC card, which is what we're using to capture, isn't an AP, so it's not designed to listen to multiple clients at the same time. And in terms of what it's designed to, in terms of downstream from the AP, it's designed to listen on one resource unit. That's all it can do. It can listen on all resource units. So the problem is, well, which one do we listen on? Because if it's sending four packets, it, the, the client doesn't know which one it's going to capture if it's passively scanning. Um, and similarly, when we're doing, um, uh, and, and it, it doesn't know which resource unit to listen on for the upstream packet because it's got four packets going at once. So what you can do with this is you can actually add in an association ID and MAC address, and it will then listen as if it's that client and sniff clients. Um, now, I've put um, Francois's blog article about how to do this at the bottom of this slide. One thing I would say is um, there's lots of people in this community who have written blogs about how to do this. Um, the reason I put Francois in there, he's got links at the bottom to all the others. So you can go there and then you can happily click away and read all the different articles about using this capture solution. Um, OK, let's have a quick look at what I could do with this solution then. Um, this is a capture using this solution. I want to sh focus just on these two columns here. And I will actually open up a packet capture in a second. But notice, suddenly we're getting HEMU frames. I'm now getting some of these multi-user. And you can also see the bandwidth. We've got 106 turn hour user. A bit later down, there's a 26 turn hour U. And we're starting to see some of this OFDMA traffic. I was like, yes. But I was only seeing it from one user. So I still wasn't getting everything, but at least it was something. OK. Um, let me show you very quickly. Um, what some of this actually looks like. Hopefully, I've tried to put a big enough font that everyone can see, so I hope that is the case. Um, first of all, before we look at um, a, a, a some OFDMA packets, this is um, a trigger frame. You'll, you'll notice um, it's just an 802.11a frame, OK? This isn't an actual AX frame. Um, it, it's going at a six meg data rate here. But what you get in these frames is you get user info. And it tells each user what its RU allocation is, how many turns it's using. The first number is just um, you're going to be using it, where in the channel it is. And there's a way of mapping that, if you know what 53 means. And it's 106 tones. And then <coughs> another user is getting 52 tones and another user's getting 52 turns. So it tells users how it's splitting up the channel. OK, so let's look at a downlink OFDMA um, transmission. You can see there's some multi-user frames here. And you can see this is 106 tone RU. So this is a frame that's just using 106 tones. It's actually half of the channel I had set up being transmitted to a client. And actually, the first part of this is actually another trigger frame. But because this is just in going to one user, it's just got one user's data in here. It was actually the user I was um, looking at. It was association ID 4. And it tells it it's got 106 tones that it's using. And then we get the remaining of all these frames here. This is actually an aggregated frame. So we're seeing the unaggregated frames here. But these are cross data frames. And this is an aggregated frame being sent in that RU, that resource unit, to the client. OK? It's quite cool, but I can only see that one client. 
At the same time, it was sending packets to two other clients and I haven't captured it. Let's look at what it quickly looks like in the other direction. So, um, in this trace file, again, I want you to look at this column here. You, we, we've got a trigger frame, which I'll talk about. And then we've got some HE trig physical layer formats. This is uplink OFDMA. Okay, this is coming from a client up. Um, if we look at the trigger frame above here, we can see the user info here. Um, and one user, association ID free, is getting 106 tones. And another user is getting another 106 tones. This was just two clients this time, so it's splitting the channel between them. And that trigger was saying, okay, both of you transmit now. And then we see one of those clients send in an aggregated frame. That's a up. So at least we can capture it, but I can only do it for one user. And the other problem with this is it's one user but I need to know the association ID. So I'm gonna to have to do a capture of its association, find out its association ID, then put it, come back in, put it into my little filter, then capture, by which time a client's roamed and it's got another association ID. Okay, from a lab environment, not very practical for day-to-day -day troubleshooting. Okay, there are my problems. Um, what is the solution? I've told a lot about problems. Well, this is something I passionately believe. The solution and the future of packet capture is AP packet capture. I genuinely believe, because of everything I've said, the capturing from NIC cards and passively listening to in the air is just almost dead on modern day networks. It's not going to give us what we need. There, there, there's some elements, and I'm going to talk about that later, which I think it can still be useful for. But, think of, but the access point is the only device that can see everything. All packets go to and from the AP. So theoretically, the AP can see all the multi-user MIMO frames and all the OFDMA frames because it has to receive them all and send them. So the one device that can give us access to all the traffic is the access point. Um, also, what do access points do? They encrypt and decrypt traffic off the air. So there's nothing potentially stopping the AP giving me all the traffic unencrypted. It could send me the traffic before it encrypts it, and it could give me the traffic after it's decrypted it. So it, it, could, it can also fix my encryption problem. It can also fix my multi-NIC card problem, because, and a lot of vendors can do this today, I can sit there and say, okay, this is a client who's having a problem. Capture me all packets for this MAC address across all APs. And any AP that sees it, any AP it runs through, is going to capture the packets, put it in a PCAP file for me and give me it. Now I don't need to push my little trolley walking around a warehouse for eight hours. I can sit in an office and just leave the APs to do the capture for me. Let's have a look then, what can we do through AP packet capture? Um, I'm gonna open up some other trace files. Um, I've, got an, I've got a number of trace files I'm gonna look at um, and captured different ways, and I, I don't want to spend too long on them. Um, but uh, AP packet capture does have limitations, okay? And this isn't me vendor bashing. Um, the, the vendors I'm showing you are all great at that. I can even use them to do packet capture at all. Um, but I, I just want you to appreciate some of the limitations. Um, the, the, this first one is actually an Aruba AP streaming data back using a remote PCAP into Wireshark, okay? Um, it's a six gigahertz packet capture. Um, 
I just want to show you a couple of things with it. Um, I'm just going to go to at the point when I associated. Um, first of all, it's a six gigahertz packet capture. So we, we see four authentication frames um, because we are doing, um, just give me one second to expand this out. We are doing simultaneous authentications of equals. This is um, how we do pre-shared key in six gigahertz. And that's why we see four authentication frames, not the usual sort of open system that we'd see often in five gigahertz and 2.4 um, with WPA2. Um, but we get the authentication, we get the four-way key exchange, which I see here, except I only see two key packets. And then we get some data frames, um, which I can fully read all the data frames because data frames are encrypted after the four-way handshake. Now, one of the things is it's interesting that I only see the messages here which come from the client. I'm not seeing the AP packets of the four-way handshake. I'm, I'm actually seeing acknowledgements, but I'm not seeing all the acknowledgements here. Um, you might, so, so for example, there's an acknowledgement here, but it's not one at the association response. It turns out I'm only seeing acknowledgements from the client, not from the AP. There's certain packets um, when an AP is doing packet capture, which never leave the radio, some control frames and and, and, and certain frames, and therefore it's very hard for the AP to capture them, okay? Um, and therefore we don't naturally always get a full capture. But anyway, what about the data frames? Is my data frames using multi-user MIMO? Well, because of this was a streaming packet capture, I don't have the um, header information, the radio tap header, so those columns are blank. So at least in this method of capturing, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm capturing multi-user, single user. I don't know what I'm capturing. OK, let's go to a Drift and AP packet capture. Um, just for comparison, I'm going to go to a Juniper AP packet capture. Um, and I'm going to go to the same point, the uh, authentication, so we can look at what we see here. And in this one, again, I see my simultaneous authentication of equals authentication. I can see my association requests response. I can see my four key packets. This time I do get all the four-way handshake, which is quite cool. Um, and what would we normally expect after a four-way handshake to see? What do you expect to see in a packet capture after a four-way handshake? Data, what type of data? Encrypted data, yeah, which I've said is a problem. But look at this. I see a DHCP request. I see a DHCP ACK. I can see, if we scroll down in here, look, there's my IP header. I can see IP addresses. I can see it's UDP. I can see the DHCP. All of these traffic is unencrypted because I'm getting it from the AP. And as I said earlier, the AP is a one device that can give me all my traffic unencrypted. This can be 802.1x, it can be WPA Enterprise Free, and I get all my traffic unencrypted. I think that's really cool. Don't know about you, I think that's really cool. Um, so actually, AP packet capture, we can see, do this with an over the air pack capture, but by capturing it from the AP, I now get my traffic unencrypted, so I can do my application level analysis as well. What do I not get though, okay? Um, so I've told you all the cool things. There's no acknowledgements in this trace file, not just I'm only seeing the client ones, I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing RTS, CTS, control frames are obviously missing. And again, it's just the way the AP does packet capture. Those frames are never leaving the radio that they can capture. It's all happening at a sort of physical chipset level, okay? So I've got different things from the Aruba capture, but still not everything, okay? What about, can I see if I'm getting multi-user traffic? That would be interesting. Is any of this um, multi-user traffic? Let's go over and have a look. Um, oh, I do get 
the PPDU format. This is all single user. Let's scroll down a bit. I might need to drag my cursor down because I didn't set a proper transfer going until later on. Oh, HE trigger frames. That is uplink OFDMA. So at least I can see that it's actually OFDMA traffic, but is it everything? Well, one thing I can see though is I've got no control frames. So I can see the trigger frames. <laughs> so I've got data and I'm, I think there's two different IP addresses sources here. So this might actually be all the data from both clients. It's unencrypted, but I'd really like to see the trigger frames. Well, what I did is capture, I only literally did this in my room um, a few nights ago. Um, it's the, I had a Google Pixel and a Dell um, laptop with an AX210 chipset in it. I also used my WLAN Pi to capture at the same time. So let's have a look at that capture. Okay. Here it is. Um, now this capture is going to have the problems I've said with over the air capture. We're not going to capture any multi-user traffic. We only capture single user. But excuse me one second. I just want to move down. What I do see inside this capture, being zoomed in makes it quite hard, but hopefully you guys can see what's happening a bit more. I do get trigger frames. Okay. So here was my idea. Could I take this capture where I'm seeing the trigger frames and I'm seeing some of the um, acknowledgements, I'm seeing the control frames and my AP capture and put them together? That would be quite cool, wouldn't it? And would that give me the full picture? Would that actually give me my full OFDMA capture? Well, there's a couple of things you've got to consider. Um, inside Wireshark from the file menu, you can merge and you can pick another caption, you can merge them together, and it merges them via timestamp. But where are my timestamps synced? Because if they're not synced, it's not really worth it. So what I did was I went to the same point in each file, um, which was basically, um, if we, I basically went to the association, um, because I, what I did capture was the authentication association in both captured, and by effectively, if we just looking at the time stamps, I could see what the offset was. And then there's a command line tool which comes with Wireshark. I don't know if you've used it. It's called Ed Edit Cap. And you can effectively offset all the time stamps by a certain amount in one capture. So the first thing I did was offset them to sync them. So I knew the two association firms were identical. And I synced the timestamps and then I merged them. Okay, let me open up that capture file then. So this was the result. Um, of it. Again, let me just quickly go to, now, of course, when you merge packet captures, you're going to get some duplicate frames. So you can see I've got the two authentication frames next to each other, two association frames next to each other. Because I've got one of them, if I click here, one of these you're going to see was captured on the interface WLAN Pi, and one of them was a radio tap. The radio tap was the one coming from the MIST AP, and the one of them comes from WLAN Pi. So I do have some duplicate packets in here. Um, there is a tool I could use to have deduped the packets. I didn't go that far, but I could have removed the duplicates if I wanted to. Um, but let's have a look at what I've captured in terms of an DMA. So I'm just going to go I, to a packet, which I've got written down, because I would have never remembered the packet number, um, 46. 336, which is where I start sending, well, it's actually in the middle of me sending data um, on to clients. Let's have a look. This is a trigger frame. Um, 
Actually, be, before I, just before I show you this, actually, let me, simple, another observation. Well, one thing that you, we're being told a lot, 802.11ax in 6 gigahertz, Wi-Fi 6E is great because what? There's no backwards compatibility. Yeah? And we're going to get much better performance because we have no backwards compatibility, do we? In 6 gigahertz. Isn't that great? In one sense, it's true in the fact that all devices have to support AX to work in 6 gigahertz. So you're not going to be waiting for like a really slow B device to be transmitting. Everyone can use AX data to AX. That is true. But what people don't like to tell you is 802.11ax is a, was designed to be backwards compatible with A, B, G, and A, C. It was, because it was deployed in 5 gig, in 2.4. It is a backwards compatible protocol, which we've just picked up and dropped in the 6 gig band. So the physical layer header and the um, preamble, they go at 6 megabits per second. It'd be nice if they went a bit faster. Because that's actually what we spend all our time doing in Wi-Fi, sending preamble and physical headers. But no, they, because they were designed to be backwards compatible, they go at the lowest data rate. It also doesn't mean we're not going to see any low data rate in 6 gigahertz. This is a 6 gigahertz capture. And what, what's this? 802.11a OFDM. Trigger frames, block acknowledgements. These 802.11a extended Mendes control frames go at an ABG data rate. You're not allowed to send them any faster. Just an observation to make. <laughs> so you are still going to see older data race in the 6 gig band. I'll let you make up what you want from that, but um, just wanted to make that observation before. Now, data frames um, are we're nearly always going to go at AX, because we only do AX. But you're going to get management and control frames going still at those lower data race. Interesting observation. Um, let's have a look at my um, transmit opportunity. So let's start, we need to start off with this trigger frame. User info. I have got association ID 3B, okay? Um, and he has been assigned 484 tones. I had an 80 megahertz wide channel. He was basically being assigned half the channel. I only had two clients of him. I had a, Google, a, a Dell laptop and a Google Pixel. So he's been assigned half the channel. Um, and then user, the second user info is for association ID 3A. And he was also being assigned 484 tones. The other half of the channel. So I've got these two devices being assigned, and this trigger frame is saying to both of them, transmit now. You can both transmit. And then what we see following, uh, you get the block act to accept the trigger frame, but then we get this HE trig frames, uplink multi-user MIMO frames. Am I seeing them from two different devices though? And here's the question. If we come down to look, I'm just going to do that so hopefully you can see a bit more detail. Hopefully you can see, um, I hope this is seeable at the back, but this one's coming from 8128, this one's from 8242, then we've got 8218, 8242, and these are aggregated frames, but we're seeing the packets merge up. These are both receive, happening at the AP at the same time, which is why they're interspersed. And this is the first time I've captured a full, with trigger frames and everything, the full exchange of OFDMA. So it's possible. Uh, it's possible. Admittedly, I had to capture it with two devices, put them together. Um, I have since learned, because I was chatting with Wes about what I was doing, um, and had I, you know, not just been using the UI and been a real engineer and used um, the API to do packet capture, apparently now on the midst AP, you can effectively do my WLAN packet capture on the scan radio. You can fix a channel 
and do a true over-the-air capture. So potentially, and I've not tried it yet, but I should, and I'm going to try this, be able to use the data radio to capture all my data, to scan radio to do my other one, and get it all from the AP. Um, that is something if you want to challenge, go and try it. Um, so it might well be that I could do this purely from one API call on the AP. Um, so I, I think that's quite exciting, and I hope it maybe convinces you that the future of protocol analysis is AP packet capture. I say that because at the very first ever WLPC conference, I think Keith will remember this, I stood on stage and said the future of packet capture is AP packet capture, and so many people told me I was wrong. Well, I'm still saying it today, but I'm just with a little bit more evidence to back it up. Um, Okay, I promise you a big announcement. So here's my big announcement. Lice. That was just for dramatic effect. Um, about just over two years ago, um, in the middle of a pandemic being locked down at home, I thought this is the perfect opportunity to start a new company. Um, so that's what I did, and I launched a, a new company called MQ Training Services. Um, and the concept behind this company was to help vendors create good educational content. Okay, um, and and the need came for and, and I, this isn't me criticising any individual vendors, but I've set an awful lot of courses in my time as an engineer, and some of them have been rubbish. Okay, have you set rubbish training classes? It happens a lot, doesn't it? And I, I was trying to think why that is, and I, I think there's a number of reasons why there's a lot of rubbish training courses. And, but, but one of the things is I'm not sure, and again, this isn't a criticism, I'm not sure vendors are always the right people to write their own courses, okay? Because I think they're just too close to the product sometimes. So, so the concept of MQ training services was, I've been trying to work out how to describe it, um, but we're, we're a vendor neutral company providing vendor-specific training. Okay? CWMP, they provide vendor-neutral training. We're trying to um, help and work with different vendors to come up with good educational content. Um, but everyone working from AMQ training and all the instructors that we are engaging with are all vendor-neutral industry experts. Um, and we've been doing some great work um, in the early years of the company. We've been working with Juniper, we've done, and we're going to continue working with Juniper. We've written some of their courses. Um, we've created um, the design.mist.com site. If you've not checked it out, that is free design training. Um, if you don't mind watching videos of me all day. Um, and now I've just put up some new 6E videos, actually, the week before this conference, so you can check those out. Um, but... And we've also um, helped um, with Akahal writing the latest ECSC troubleshooting class. Um, we've written some um, certification exams. But, and we're, we're actually talking with a lot of other vendors, so there's going to be a lot more announcements coming. But today, I do have a new relationship I want to announce to you today um, with one vendor, which I'm quite excited about. So I thought, hey, why not announce it on stage at a conference? Dum, da, da, dum, drum roll. How are you? So we have agreed with Hamner to be their official training partner, um, creating their courses, um, providing educational content. So I want to tell you just a, I've got five minutes, which is plenty of time, just to tell you a little bit about what's coming. Um, it's... It's coming, hopefully this year, we're going to be starting with some new courses. Um, we're going to very, the very first course out the door is just going to be a one-day product training class. So you may have set many design courses before. You may be CWDP, you may have you know, other design courses, and you've been doing design for a long time, but you just want to learn how to use this new tool and how to apply the skills you've got to a new tool. That's what that course is going to be designed for. One day, product training, how to use the software, 
and how to get the best out of it. Following that up later on, we will be coming up with a full three, four day, probably undecided yet, but full certified training class. Um, certified Hamano engineer class. So you will be able to literally take a full class. Um, we'll teach some of the Wi-Fi design principles and we'll teach you how to use the tools to create absolutely amazing designs and surveys. Um, and so that is coming. Um, and then later on, there's, there's plans for even more courses. Um, some of the courses we want to do, because um, I, I think it's missing in the industry, is vertical specific design classes. So if you're a guy who you just do warehouses day in, day out, how do you design for warehouses? And what do you need to know to take a tool and get a good warehouse design? What about if you do stadium design? High, very high density design. Well, we're going to create a very high density design class that focuses primarily on how do you design for that environment. So that's what's coming. So look out for updates. We've got a new website coming um, we're gonna where you're going to be able to book courses. Um, we've got, we're going to be announcing some instructors. And we've got literally some of the leading industry instructors. I'm really excited who are going to be working and teaching these classes. Um, so they're going to be taught globally. So that's what's coming. Please do announce it. I'm going to finish my time. Thank you very much.